freedom that occurs when we radically accept that God's promises are about who God is and not about ourselves. Do you see how we don't need to doubt them, how they are guaranteed? Paul says that against all hope, Abraham believed God, even though he was 75 and God told him to get up and move. He did it. Even though he was 100 and his wife was barren. I love how it says, even though his body was as good as dead, he believed God. He believed the pronouncement that he would be the father of many nations. Abraham believed everything that God had spoken because it was about who God was, not about who Abraham was. He had that inner faith. Paul says that he was fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised to do. And so it was credited to him as righteousness. He was credited as righteous, as a man close with God, not based on the acts that he did, but the faith that was deeply a part of him. The Bible talks a lot about what we're to do, but more than anything, it talks about what we're supposed to do in here, how our inner, inner life is supposed to be. Jesus spends a lot of time talking to the disciples about this, but how we need to cultivate this inner connection with God. This is why he says that it's not just about do not murder, do not steal, do not envy. Jesus says it's about do not hate and do not lust. Jesus says that it, a good tree cannot produce bad fruit because the fruit is about what's happening on the inside of the tree. Jesus talks about don't just wash the outside of the cup. Make sure the inside is clean as well. Over and over and over again, what Jesus highlights in his ministry is the need to have this inner place, this inner deep recess of ourselves right with God in faith. But of course, it doesn't mean that we're never going to mess up. We will. Paul describes Abraham in verse 19 as not weakening in his faith. This doesn't suggest that Abraham was perfect. Although Abraham was a model of faith, he was a man who had deep flaws. If you read Genesis, you come across those glaringly. He made mistakes. He tried to take matters into his own hands several times and then caused problems along the way. Yet the fact is, even though Abraham's journey was sometimes a messy journey, it was a journey where he wholeheartedly dedicated himself to as best as he could living out his faith, living within the promises that God had given him. Our journey sometimes can be a messed up journey. It can be a journey that takes all these kind of wrong, wrong turns and roundabout ways. But it's about this inner, this inner place of where we as best as we can, in, the, in this moment, attempt to live our connection with God. Again, Watchman Nee says that living in faith or abiding in Jesus is not about trying. It's about trusting. Trusting that God's promises are gifts to be received, not stars to be earned. Trusting that love and forgiveness and grace is about who God is, not about how well we do. Trusting that in the end, what our Christian life is all about is how Jesus was delivered over to death for the forgiveness of our sins and raised to life so that we could be free to receive the promises of God. That truth, and that truth alone, is to be the core of our heart of faith. Let me ask you, have you been focusing on trying to figure out your spiritual steps? What the best steps are that you need to do in your life of faith? Have you been struggling how to move deeper in your relationship with God and thinking about, you know, what are the tools, what are the actions in order to do that? You know, in some sense, this kind of reading, it presents us with a very odd question. Because if we say, okay, I understand 
that our Christian life is not about what we do, it's about what's inside. What do I need to do to focus on the inside? And we kind of end up going around and around and around. Dallas Willard, he writes, All activities must be seen in the context of an intimate, personal walk with Jesus as our constant Savior and Teacher. No formula can be written for spiritual formation, for it is a dynamic relationship and one that is highly individualized. It's a relationship. My relationship with Alicia is not about what I do. Thank God for that. Uh, it's not about what I do. It's a state that I live in. It is something that goes to the deepest part of me. And yes, that informs my actions, which are sometimes great, maybe sometimes not so great. But more than anything, it is about a deep place of love and passion. That is what this passage is all about. That is what we are to cultivate in our lives. If we truly long to be connected to God in the deepest, most dynamic manner possible. So for you, for me, for us, we are to focus on living your faith from the inside out. And if for you that means that you need to take up the Bible and read more and sit with it and, and dive in, then go for it. If for you that means that you have to stop trying to learn more things and understand it all, and maybe simply spend some time with God, be still and know that I am God, then go for it. If for you it means that you need to look at the motivation behind all of your spiritual actions, then do it. If for you it means that you need to be challenged to actually live out your faith more visibly, then do it. This will mean something different for every single person. Lent is a wonderful time to take stock of our spiritual life. right, And to look at the inside and say, how am I doing here? It's going to be different for all of us, but the end result will always be the same, no matter who we are. When we focus on the inside, what is produced in us is an abiding connection with Jesus. What is produced in us is inner feelings of, of love and strength and peace that cannot be described or explained, but overwhelms us. And what we receive is the security of knowing that God's promises to us are secure and steadfast. May we all take a step, a further step, to live more deeply in our faith and to live it from the inside out.